by way of announcement. Tomorrow is March 19th. There, uh, there won't be Mass here. I have Mass in the morning in Chicago and then in the evening in Kentucky. So, but you will have Holy Week. Father Pfeiffer will be here for Holy Week, so you'll be spoiled all that week with uh, Mass and the ceremonies and confessions, etc. So do uh, value that time, and Father will no doubt be giving um, some conferences, some missions. So you want to make sure you fulfill the, the laws of the church, which are, of course, go to confession at least once a year, and go to communion during the Easter time, which goes from, from Septuagesima to Trinity Sunday. Of course, that's the bare minimum. In today's battle, in today's war, if that's all we do, we're going to probably not make it to heaven. We really have to fight for heaven. We really have to sanctify our soul and really chase after our Lord. If we don't chase Him, we're going to lose Him. We have to be... Uh, the hunters have their hunting season. But for us, hunting season is always... Actually, Christ is the hunter who hunts souls but we must also chase Him. And uh, that's a great grace we must really pray for. So tomorrow being Sunday, the third Sunday of Lent, St. Joseph's Feast, which would normally be tomorrow, is transferred to Monday. So the great Feast of St. Joseph is Monday. So don't forget and to honor the great St. Joseph and to celebrate in His honor. Of course, that's not a fast day. That's a given. Nor is St. Patrick's in the United States. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This Mass is the Gospel. Our Lord's speaking about the two sons of the Father. What our Lord is saying, He's giving three, three parables. The first is the lost sheep. Second is the lost coin. The third is the, the prodigal son. And what our Lord is saying this, because the, the Pharisees are seeing our Lord walking among the sinners, and He's talking with them, and He's preaching to them, and He's working miracles for them. And this is the living God, who is among the dirt of the earth, we could say, but he's, he is the good shepherd who seeks to bring back the sinner. And this gospel shows, of course, the great love, the great mercy, and the great desire of God to save all souls. He wants all souls to be saved, but he doesn't handcuff us. He doesn't force us. God is not that way. The animals can't love God, but they do perfectly his will. The movement of the stars and the planets, they perfectly follow God's mathematical precision to have our days and months so accurate. They all obey God's will, even the waves of the sea and the, the, the laughing of the fields and the wind and the fall and the winter. But men, we can turn from God. We have this dangerous thing called free will. And just think how many millions of souls right now are burning in the center of the earth for all eternity because they misuse and, and they threw away the treasures of God to damn their souls forever. And they only had one lifetime to do it. Some of them had eight years. Some of them had 50. Some of them had 100, over 100. But whatever time God gave them, they, they blew it away. They threw it away. And we could be there too. Any of us can be there. None of us have the guarantee. We are not Protestants. And we don't live in a lie and illusion that I'm just saved because I believe in the Catholic faith. we got to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We have to, as our Lord said, watch. Be watchful and pray. Lest you enter into temptation. And we must... Fight. We must fight, not as beating the air, says St. Paul, but running with certainty. Because we know the love of God. We know His commandments. We know we have to gain heaven. We know we have to escape the fires of hell. And this is the great thing that the Catechism gives to children when they're young. When they know the faith, 
these children don't have, they don't need to have these psychological problems. They know what they're here on earth for. And that solves so many problems, because so many atheist kids, so many godless families, these poor kids have no clue where they're going all their life. They're just floating. But with the faith, we're certain, it's clear. We're in war, and we've got to get to heaven. And we have all the weapons God gave us. And we have, of course, the great love and the mercy of God. His mercy is real, and His love for sinners is really real. He hates the sin, of course, but He loves the sinners that we all are. And we are all poor, poor sinners. We're born slaves of the devil. We were all born with the chains of the devil wrapped around us. Our souls were pitch black. And Christ drove out the prince of that battlefield. He drove out the devil in our baptism. And he took possession with the blessed trinity in our soul. And turned it into something magnificent and beautiful. With a true dignity, which is the blessed trinity living in the soul called sanctifying grace. And with sanctifying grace comes the, the right to go to heaven. The friendship of the blessed trinity. The very participation in the very life of God. And all the merits that you obtain from the age of reason. And see the goodness and mercy of God. That He knew we would fall. He knew we are weak. He knew we would trip up many times. And He, he applies to Himself what He told St. Peter. Lord, should I forgive my neighbor seven times? Thinking he was really generous and really being exaggerated. Should I forgive my neighbor seven times? <laughs> and Christ's response is, no, Peter, not seven times, but seven times, seventy times. Meaning, always be ready to forgive. That goes with us and our neighbor, and God is with that with us. He is so merciful, He is so good, that any repentant and, and contrite sinner, he will never turn away, ever. Ever. And this is why we should love, love that great grace of the Catholic Church called the perfect act of contrition. We never know if we really make it, but we should make it as often as we can. And never let a night go by without making a perfect act of contrition. What is that? The perfect act of contrition is sorrow for offending God, because I spit on God, because I crucified Him, I scourged Him, I kicked Him. And we all have, myself included, for, uh, for, by our sins. By our sins. So, our Lord is quick to show mercy, and He wants to forgive, and, he, and this is why He gives these three great parables. So the one of today is the prodigal son. So I'd like to bring out just a couple things from this story. And the story is, is great because it's right from Christ's sacred heart. It's He that's telling it. And He's among thieves, adulterers, fornicators, partiers, drunkards, druggies. He's among them all. And He makes it known to them the mind of God. And he tells that story. And the Pharisees are standing a far, kind of not far off, but they're there. And they're mumbling among themselves, what's, if, if he's a Messiah, what's he doing with sinners? Because remember, the Pharisees had this false, this false hypocritical notion that you could not even uh, touch a dead body. You can't touch a sinner because you'll get contaminated. But, but they were sinners themselves. <laughs> so they lived in this false hypocritical illusion and so Christ tells the story of the man who had two sons and the one son asked his father give me my substance because I'm out of here I've had enough of this place something many parents actually do here <laughs> and this young son he asked for the substance. What is the substance? That's his inheritance. It's all that God gave us. The fathers of the church say, what is the substance that you have? Your ability to know God. Your ability to love Him. Your talents that God gave you. Your body, your soul, 
your family, your house, your city, your neighborhood, those you work with, those you live with. These are all gifts of God. And he's asking for this to spend it away in sin. And he goes far from God. And this is what the fathers of the church say when he, he leaves his father's house. And he goes into a far country. St. Augustine says far country is he's far from God by sin. His mind is far from God. His heart is in the mud. He loves earthly things and the earthly vanities. And there he wasted his substance. That is, his mind on focusing only on this world. His heart chasing only the pleasures of this life. And, he, and in living riotously, Christ says, living riotously. That is, not just in impurities, fornication and adultery, but also drunkenness, drugs, partying, rowdy parties, etc. Dirty jokes and the whole, the whole scene. And after he had spent all there, there came a mighty famine in that country, and he began to be in want. This famine is when the soul realizes it, it cannot be satisfied with anything in this world. St. Augustine knew this, didn't he? St. Augustine, he, he was this prodigal son. He went off to study in Carthage, and he lived in North Africa, in Tagast. He went off to Carthage, and uh, his father wasn't a great example either, but his mother was a, was a gem, St. Monica. And so what did St. Augustine do? He partied it up, but he was, he was not a fool either. He was very intelligent, he was very gifted. But he was given his talents to become a good orator. And he was using his gifts to, in, 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 like a lawyer or an attorney, for unjust causes. And his sinful life caught up with him. And St. Augustine would say, from experience, because he, 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 he himself says, I was steeped in all lust. I was steeped in breaking all the commandments. And he said, uh, at his conversion finally, he said, Late have I known thee, Lord. Late have I loved thee. And he said, also his great words, Lord, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Our hearts are never at peace, are never happy until they rest in the source of all happiness. And go ahead. Go ahead. Our Lord tells He doesn't bind us by chains. Go ahead and taste the bitterness of the world. Go ahead and see how horrible and dark it is to live in sin. And how many suicides. And how many, <clears throat> how many hateful marriages. And how many sad divorces. And how many wrecked up families. And how many girls in tears. And how many men ready to put a, a rifle to their head because of sin. And sin, the devil is also, look what, it, look what our Lord also adds to this. And after he had spent all, there came a mighty famine in that country, and he began to be in need. And he went and cleaved to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his farm to feed swine. Now who is that citizen of that country? St. Gregory, St. Augustine, and most of the fathers and St. Ambrose, they say, <clears throat> that's the devil. The devil has him as a slave, and he's got him. He's got him in habits of vice, habits of sin. He's got him in a in drug, abuse, a drug addiction. He's got him, uh, he's got a child now, like St. Augustine did. So the devil gets them stuck, and they think they can't get out. <clears throat> And he, what did he do? He, he went to his farm to feed porcos in Latin, pigs. So the devil leads the soul to fall lower than the lowest animals, into the lowest vices. And he pushes souls into vice after vice after vice. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk of the wine, of the, excuse me, of the swine, 
He ate the husks, he ate them, and no man gave unto him. So the husks are the emptiness. Saint, the fathers of the church say they, 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 they irritate the stomach. Then they don't fill it. They don't fill it. And think of the city, the, the country of Ukraine that was starved out in 1932 to 33. Completely starved out. While Stalin and the communists had huge fields with mounds of grain surrounded by bar barbed wire fences and guards. While the Ukrainian Catholic people starved to death. There was no more animals, no dogs, no cats, no trees with leaves, no grass. All of it had been eaten. And that's the good old days when people respected each other. Today, they'd be animals. And look at Leningrad. Leningrad under the communists as well. This one of the now St. Petersburg in Russia. These people were left reduced to starvation and freezing. They were dropping in the streets, just frozen, starving. And that's, that's the state of soul. Starving, thirsty for truth, thirsty for God. And the devil just makes of a slave of such a poor soul. And this is the fruit of sin. Death, sadness, despair. And returning to himself, he said, St. Augustine will go on about this and say, this was a great grace for this man to turn to himself, to see his soul as he really is. A lost soul on the verge of going to hell if he died, without God's grace, a slave of the devil. And that's, that's a great grace. And then what, what, does, what happens? And returning to himself, he said, How many hired servants in my father's house abound with bread, and I here perish with hunger. I will arise, and I will go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am not worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So you see, this is the grace of God moving a soul. From a state of sin to the state of grace, that it takes it takes a grace of God to move a soul even to want to come back to Him by confession, by contrition. It has to be God's grace. No one can come to me unless the Father draw him, and that drawing is by grace. I have sinned against heaven and before thee. So I want to just bring out some of the words of the fathers about confession. Because this man goes finally, he arises from his slavery to sin, and he goes to his father. And that is a soul who moved by grace, and corresponding with grace, decides with God's grace to come back to the sacred heart of Jesus. And this can happen right before death. This can happen in a state of emergency, and if you don't have time to go to confession, you go, you go to the sacred heart of Jesus. He can forgive, and He can give the state of grace, and He can give perfect contrition. And that's why when we're dying, you want to make sure you're, you have prayed well the act of contrition, and gone to confession if you can. And the Father, notice, He wants to come back. Let me read this. This is, the, this is his first confession. Father, I have sinned, says St. Ambrose, to the author of nature, the source of mercy, the judge of sin. For even though God knows all things, he still awaits the words of thy confession. Because whoever takes the burden of his sins upon himself lessens its weight. And he who by confession anticipates the accuser deprives the accusation of its sting. In vain wilt thou endeavor to hide from him, in other words, not go to confession and not tell our sins. In vain will you do this, whom nothing deceives. God is not deceived. And you may safely divulge what you know to be already known. In other words, St. Ambrose is saying, 
It's part of the medicine to confess our sins. We might be embarrassed, we might not like to, but it is God's way of doing it, to humble our pride. <clears throat> Furthermore, God justly and fitly demands of the sinner the confession of his sin. First, because the criminal ought to humble himself and confess his crime if he wishes to be forgiven. And one of the saints says, the devil can trap us from all our senses, but we can only be freed by one of them, that's confession. Through the confession of our sins in the Holy Confessional. Where we confess, yes, to the priest, but it's really to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And the Sacred Heart of Jesus really washes away the, the sins on the soul, and frees and breaks the chains, and increases grace, if it's venial sins, confessed, and restores grace if it's mortal sins confessed and contrite for. Secondly, confession is so important. Why? Because just as a stomach filled with coarse foods and bad juices must be purged by vomiting, so too the soul, which is full of vicious offenses and sins, must be purified by confession, says Origen, one of the great fathers of the church. The third reason for confession, because the majesty of God, which has been offended by the sinner, requires repentance as satisfaction and reparation to its honor. For repentance glorifies God and restores to Him the honor which sin has taken away. See, when I sin, I make myself God, or my pleasure, or my vanity, or my thing, or this car, or this house, or this object. That becomes my God. So when by repentance and confession, we restore God to His proper place. Finally, the fourth reason. The penitent acknowledges that, that acknowledges that God is most holy, while He Himself is a sinner. The confession of a sinner, therefore, is to the praise and glory of God, the Creator, as well as of Jesus Christ, the Savior. The reason is given by St. Cyprian, or whoever wrote the treatise on the Passion. Quote, When the sinner takes upon himself the office of judge and executioner, because that's what we do when we go to confession, isn't it? We enter a court case. And Christ told the priests, the apostles, receive the power to forgive sins or not forgive. So the priest sits as a judge and he has to hear the evidence. It's a court case. But the accuser is ourselves in confession. So better, says St. Cyprian, that we judge and, and accuse ourselves, prosecuting himself and dignifying his confession by the shame that he exhibits by telling his sins. This sweet-smelling holocaust, this sacrifice, and it is painful to have to go to confession. For some souls, they get very nervous. Some, some souls, the devil tries to scare them by fear, or worry, or human respect. But this is a sweet sacrifice to God, and obtains pardon for him in the sight of God, for God does not pass judgment twice on the same offense. And the reason why St. Saint, Saint Cyprian speaks about better to accuse ourselves now, because at our death, the devils will rise up and they will know all our sins. They're going to know every single word we've spoken, every single injustice, every theft, every lie, everything. And they're going to come up and bring this all before the judge. And they're going to say, He's mine, Lord, because He did this, 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 and this. And Christ is going to say, But He confessed all this to me. He's been forgiven. He's mine, not yours. So this is why confession is so powerful. So this, and then let me just also bring out another great point brought out by the fathers and by Christ himself. Notice when the prodigal son comes. Notice the mind of the father. This shows the love, the love of the sacred heart. And rising up, he came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him 
and was moved with compassion. In the Greek, it says, the fathers of the church say, the Greek is more expressive. His, his whole entrails were moved with extreme grief and love for his son. He is, his whole being is moved. And is this not what happened on the cross? That Christ, his whole blood was poured out to the, blast, the very last drops out of his sacred heart for us poor sinners. He really, as it says in Psalm 21, my chest has become, my heart has become like liquid wax in my chest. Because love becomes like liquid. Your heart is moved to compassion. And the sacred heart of Jesus poured out himself, his heart, like liquid. Blood and water out of his heart. And that's what happens in the Mass. This is what you're going to drink very soon in Holy Communion. And the Father was moved with compassion. And running to him, fell upon his neck and kissed him when he was yet a great way off. So one of the fathers say, running to him and fell upon his neck. And that is, running to him with Christ God becoming man. He, God came down running to us to save us from going to hell. And with his arm, that is Christ, worked the redemption by dying on the cross and kissed him. And what is this kiss? It is through the lips of confession. We kiss the sacred heart of Jesus as it were, when we fall at his feet, like St. Mary Magdalene, the penitent, and kiss his feet by the confessing our tears, confessing our sins with tears of repentance. And when he was a great way off to, to him, fell upon his neck and kissed him, when he was yet a great way off. So the father went out to chase him down. And then, he, and then he clothes him. And the, the clothing is these. And the father said to his servant, Bring forth quickly the first robe, that sanctifying grace, which is restored to the soul every confession, and increased by every confession and act of contrition. And put it on him, and put a ring on his finger. There's many explanations of the ring, but one of them is, from one of the fathers of the church. It's a ring of gold which is the mark of a free and rich or noble man. And a golden ring is put on the soul because you are made free from the slavery of the devil. You're made rich with the supernatural treasures of grace. All the virtues, the beatitudes, all the merits are given back. And then you're made noble. And this is the true dignity of man, not the foolish dignity of human dignity of Vatican II nonsense and the new theology nonsense but the real dignity that comes with sanctifying grace because by sanctifying grace you're not just a brother to the angels you are a, a true son and daughter of the blessed trinity you share in the life of the trinity and the, fatted, the, the ring is the freedom the richness and the nobleness that comes with grace and then finally the fatted calf Oh, the, the shoes on the feet, that's the other one. That's the good example of the saints before us. And then the fatted calf, all the fathers of the church are unanimous on this one, is the Holy Eucharist. Jesus Christ is the calf. And why fat? Why fatted? One of the, one of the fathers says, St. Augustine, says that Christ is the calf that is fatted, that is fed very well, because he was loaded with insults. He was loaded with humiliation and insults in the passion. He was spit on, kicked, scourged, head to foot, front and back, completely naked. The Father commands it to be brought. That is, commands Christ to be preached. And so the fatted calf is killed. That is, every single Mass... He, Christ himself feeds our soul. And then the other son is, gets all jealous because why are all the rejoicing for his son, for the bad guy that, be, that came back? And the father corrects his, the other son because he's jealous. 
And he said, I never broke the laws of the house. I never offended you. But the son did offend by his jealousy, by his envy. And the fathers of the church say that the son who got jealous, who never did anything wrong, was the Jews. The Jews who rejected Christ and are jealous because so many Gentiles now, that's the non-Jews, have, have the Catholic faith and go to heaven. So this is the great, the great parable right out of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So let us uh, really ask in this Lent, this, the true repentance, the true contrition for our sins, and to really strive to grow in the love of God, to really strive to be conformed to Christ and Christ crucified. And remember to offer, offer all our penances, offer your sacrifice, offer your daily duties, your daily rosaries, with the Immaculate Heart of Mary, to save souls from hell, to make reparation for our sins, and to root out sin from our own life, from our own habits, from our thoughts, from our heart, from our mind. So, after the Mass, there'll be, I think, a, what is it, a, potluck dinner, and I'll give a conference after Mass as well. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.